Welcome to the What's Your Ceiling podcast. We're your hosts, Monty Wyatt and Paul Szynski. Wherever you are in life, there is a higher ceiling. This podcast is how you become aware of it and how to take action to push through it. It's time to discover your ceiling. Welcome to the What's Your Ceiling podcast, where we talk about your health, your family, your business. I'm Monty Wyatt. I'm Paul Szyzynski. And we have an incredible guest today. We're going to introduce him in a moment, but we're going to have a topic today that's going to be exciting. So, Paul, introduce our guest. I'm, I'm really excited about our guest today. Yeah, Monty, we have a great guest today. And talk about mental toughness and breaking through ceilings. We have a gentleman here that's from uh, Rapid City, South Dakota. He went from being a uh, small town, South Dakota, broke several records, not only in the state of South Dakota, but went on and set goals, uh, went on to college, become an NCAA champion, went on to set another goal to be an Olympic champion, he became Olympic champion. And uh, he comes from a great family, uh, and we're gonna talk a little bit about that today, how he reached those goals and broke through that next ceiling. And I'll tell you, it's, it's an unbelievable story, and I think you're gonna love his story and how he did it, how his mindset, and, uh, you know, Monty, I think we couldn't ask for a better guy to be here to talk about breaking through that ceiling. Absolutely. He's got, so I'd like to introduce to you Randy Lewis, Olympic gold, 1984 Olympian, Hawkeye wrestler, South Dakota Rapid City wrestler, a wonderful guy. And we're going to hear some great stories today. You do not want to miss it. Randy, welcome to the show. Thank you very much. Glad to be here. You know, we, we always have a topic for our show and a lot of what wrestling is about and what you've done is mental and physical toughness and that's that's what our topic is today is mental and physical toughness because no matter if you're in sports you're in business you're in family you're in life it is about mental and physical toughness and so paul when you hear the phrase mental and physical toughness what comes to mind for you mental toughness is maybe it's not always even physical it's it's about getting up in the morning really realizing when you've been defeated or you don't feel well but you still push through that ceiling to make sure that for you to go to the next level you have to get up and you got to achieve that and it comes from mental toughness and uh, we got the guy here to talk about that absolutely so Randy I'm gonna ask you the same question when you think of mental and physical toughness what what comes to mind with you besides just a picture of yourself? Because that you know the stories <laughs> the, the stories that you've been telling us is all mental and physical toughness. So I I'd, I'd well, love to I, hear your view. And, and, and another thing I want to talk. He's a writer on top of that, and the toughest kid on the block. You've wrote about that. You wrote several things uh, in the past, but about wrestling. So, but anyway, go ahead. Yeah. Um, well, what. I always love wrestling, and I like to. And I set the national record with 45 pins in a row in high school, and so I was expecting to pin everybody, and I kept getting better and better, and I felt like I was doing all the right things, going to wrestling camps, going to tournaments, lifting weights, running cross country, and believing in in myself. And my my parents helped me out a lot, a lot with that. Uh, I grew up uh, with a pole vault pit in my backyard because I was a champ. My dad was a state champion pole vaulter, and uh, had a trampoline, so I could do like 20 backflips in a row when I was in fourth grade. And so, and I thought that I was going to be in the NFL or the NBA or Major League Baseball or something. And then I found out that I wasn't going to be big enough to be in the NFL. And when I, I knew that my NFL career was over, when I when I was five feet when in when I was a junior in high school and I was five feet four and could only run a five four 40 yard dash <laughs> my, height and my, my height and my time in the 40 were both five four so then I knew wrestling was going to be my sport and uh well I guess I knew that before that 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 I was gonna and my goals were to be an Olympic champion and I was pretty much sure that I was destined to be one when I did all the right things to make sure that I got there now you so you you were uh, always set goals as other. Oh yeah, and my dad and I each year we'd set down goals and and uh, like I remember before my sophomore year in high school, I had won. Uh, uh, I wrestled at 90 pounds and I'd won my AU age group national tournament, and my closest match was eight points. So my my goal at the start of the year was to beat everybody by eight points, and then it, uh, I wrestled at the Sioux Falls Invitational. I was 11 and 0 with 11 pins. And I wrestled a guy named Phil Hammond, who was ranked number two in the state. 
And I got ahead of him 11 to 1 in a minute 12 and pinned him in a minute 12 in the first period. And it was like, wow, I just beat the guy, second best guy in the state. And uh, then my teammates told me, Lewis, you're going to pin everybody the whole year. And that was my new goal then. Uh, it was to pin everybody the whole year. And I did that. I pinned, I went 29 0 with 29 pins. Wow. And uh, then I just felt like I'm supposed to pin everybody at nationals. And, and, uh, by my senior year, I I I, uh, I actually had a Greco-Roman national tournament. My first that was one of my second second Greco Greco-Roman tournament I wrestled, and I pinned all six guys I wrestled. And uh, but uh, I set my goals, and and I wanted to pin everybody I wrestled, and I was out there to throw everybody on their back, and and. Uh, I was from South Dakota, and people said, well, that's only he's only pinning them from there of South Dakota. But I was pinning a lot of state champs from other schools and from California, from Iowa, from there, that. And so it was, uh, it, was fun to, it was fun to go out there and put on a show, and, and I loved to wrestle in front of the crowds, and I never yeah. felt any pressure because I just uh, – I know that I gave my best in every match I ever wrestled. I, there's not um, – some people say that they hate losing. Well, I know I gave my best, and if I – lost you I'm going to make the adjustments that I'm going to need to make to beat you the next time and some of my some of my best friends are the guys that have beaten me I'm really good friends with Jim Gibbons who I'm four and three against I'm 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 uh, seven and five against Ricky Delegato who's one of my best friends and uh, John Smith and Leroy Smith have beaten me and I've beaten them and Tim Szeski I just saw him I'm five and five against him I'm five and five against Mike Landon these people are some of my best friends now before you went on to the collegiate level in the college yeah. you were you what was your record in high school I mean how many how well, did my, that go my last three years I was 89 and 0 with 83 pins and uh, one default and I really don't and I felt like I had the guy pinned in three of the matches the ref just didn't call it but yeah. in those matches I won 23 to, to 2 and 9 to, 9 to 0 against a guy that I had pinned three times and he was a state champ from North Dakota finally he didn't I didn't pin him but anyways I, I generally pinned every I my last three years I was pretty dominant so you go 101 and 2 in college or high school yeah so you were obviously getting recruited from probably about everybody in the country yes right? yes i was so how did you end up deciding to pick the iowa hawkeyes well it came down to there were three my dan dan gable's first year as a head coach was my senior year in high school so i was his first recruiting class so people didn't know that dan gable was going to be a great coach yet but uh they thought he was and that was um and I was one, me and Dave Schultz were the two top recruits, and 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 but but I know that what I wanted, because I I had set the national record with 45 straight pins, and I was in high school. And I what I wanted in college, I wanted to wrestle in a place. I wanted to be on a national championship team, and I wanted to have good workout partners, and I wanted to have crowds. And I know that the, the three schools that all had what I wanted were Iowa, Iowa State, and Oklahoma State. They all had great workout rooms and they had the, they had great people in there and they and my senior year Iowa State won it Iowa State won nationals that year Oklahoma State got second and Iowa got third and so it was down to those three and uh, um, it came down to just because uh, of Gable and Jay Robinson uh, and uh, the other coaches when I that recruited me when I told them I've got it narrowed down to Oklahoma State Iowa and Iowa State and I asked them who they recommended and all all three of the other coaches that I got recruited by um, Bobby Douglas at, from Arizona State and and uh, Dwayne Clevins from Wisconsin and and um, 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 can't remember who else but they all said they saw me going to Gable and 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 I came there and Iowa had the fans and then when I went there we won nine straight years in a row hmm. and I feel like I had a, a pretty big part of that as I helped us win quite a few of those yeah this is some pretty legendary uh, yeah. stories about in that wrestling room I mean there's probably you know Dan Gable there's no day off yeah when you went in there you wrestled exactly and you wrestled hard yes yeah. and uh a lot of those wrestling, they don't just let everybody in there to watch that either. And uh, they have open practices now, but I know... Uh, well, yeah, we had open practices then. Anybody could come in and watch. Did you? Yeah, yeah. Uh, and I, I'm sure as you were growing, I mean, 
So you go into your freshman year. It wasn't. I mean, you had guys in the room that were national title. I uh, I couldn't I, I couldn't wait for my matches because there's nobody in the room I could beat my freshman year. But I I beat everybody except for Mike Land uh, in my mat- college matches. Uh, I went thirty and six, and four of my losses were to Mike Land, and he was he dominated me all four matches. But I pretty much dominated everybody else. I wrestled everybody. I wrestled everybody else, and I had 30 wins. 26 of them were by pins or or major decisions. I I had a style that I could put people on their back and make it exciting. And yeah. and I mean, I remember one match I came out and got taken down three times in the first minute, and so I was behind six to six to three at the end of the first period, and I ended up winning 24 to eight because I, I I had matches like that, and I had some matches that were 10 to 10 at the end of the first period. And uh, but then I'd get ahead like twenty eight to twelve and pin them or something. Now were you, you were an All American your freshman year. Yeah, I got second as a true freshman. And then you won the sophomore and junior year. Yeah. And then it, this is a, a good example. And what, I'm, what I'm proud of about my freshman year is that we won the nationals by a half a point. And at the national tournament, I had three pins and I won fifteen to one my other match before the finals. And if I don't get those three pins. If, if I just win by decision in the semifinals, we'd have lost the national tournament. But I pinned the guy in the semifinals, and and so we end up winning by half a point. Was was would that would have been the first year you started the? Yes, the that win. was the first year of nine years in a row for Gabe. Nine years in a row. Nine yeah. years in a row we won while I was there. So you go on to win the national title the next year and the next year, and then you go your senior year. You're on TV, and you get your arm broke. Yeah, I dislocated my elbow pretty bad Disco against Jim kid. Gibbons. It, it yeah. was all the way back to the shoulder. Yeah, it was uh, bent way back, and I thought my arm was broke off. I looked over, and it was like, yeah. and I was begging them to give me some drugs and knock me out because I said I was, I'm such a, uh, I don't like pain. <laughs> it hurt. <laughs> well, as a wrestler, you live. I, I made a use a little stronger language than that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that was quite a deal back. In yeah, the- it was a pretty brutal injury. It was. And, and they I, said it was one of the worst injuries ever shown on TV at the it time. It was kind of like they people thought it reminded them of Joe Theismann when he broke his ankle. You remember that when uh-huh. he was playing for Notre Dame as, as far as publicity. Uh, yeah. yeah. but uh, So then then you go, you break your arm, you finish. You didn't, you didn't stop wrestling that year. You just finished. Well, I, I sat out for six weeks, and I wrestled at the Big Tens and the Nationals, and I got – Second in the Big Tens and uh, seventh at Nationals. Yeah. And I, and so, I, yeah. Well, it, it, it's pretty admirable of you to rehab it and mm-hmm. get right back in the ring there to wrestle because a lot of people would say, you know, I need to take it six months off to rehab and, and come back. And you got right back in there and uh, started Well, I had wrestling. to. I didn't have a choice. Dan Gable told you you're all in. Well, I was, I mean, it was Nas- Big Tens and Nationals, you know. Right, your last year. Then I sat, I sat out for, uh, then I, I rehabbed for about six months after that. But I, I went, after I dislocated that elbow, I went two and a half years without winning a, a single tournament anywhere. I, 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 I lost my mental edge and had to regain it, had to learn how to wrestle with injuries and overcome it. I, before, I'd never been hurt, and I was always like, I was in like Tom Brand's shape with Randy Lewis skill level, so I always just felt like nobody could go with me a whole match. And if you did, I'm gonna throw you on your back several times and pin you. And then after that, I was, every time I wrestled, I was coming off an injury, whether it was other injuries I got that I'd never had before, and I'd never gotten that, I was never ever, got, I've never ever gotten in as good a shape as I was before I got injured. But then I had to learn, how to wrestle with other things, and I, and Stan Desik made a he was my he was a, a world champ and Olympic bronze medalist, and he was one of my coaches in '84, and he was high up, and and I and he said that after I dislocated my elbow, he said that was going to make me better because I'm going to make the adjustments and learn. And I used to like have a, this bear hug that I hid, and the, there were like five guys that were better upper bodied me uh, back in college 
uh, Andre Metzger was better than me up there. Ricky Delegata. Uh, let's see, a guy from, I uh, can't remember his name, from Nebraska that, that just threw me around. Um, I made the adjustments after that that because I couldn't reach around and lock up a bear hug and stuff, I became better at the double overhook and throwing guys mm-hmm. and using – uh, as I became less athletic because of injuries, I blew my knee out a couple times and I couldn't lace leg throw. The, the way I did it instead, after I made the adjustment, actually worked way better. Even, so I hit it. That There's, is really interesting. Yeah. You know, body. Yeah. This is a perfect example. So you went two years of injuries, not winning the tournament. But you still had the, I, I, like I the got beat. The gold. I won the Midlands three times when I was in college. I wrestled it three times after that when I was out of college, and I never won it. And I was like losing the guy. You know, I I I, can't, I was always coming off of injuries and never in my my mind for a couple of years. Then I had to learn and, and I I made the adjustments that I had to make. I got and they changed the wrestling changes their rules all the time. Well. Uh, now all of a sudden they start putting you down for stalling. So I got really good at the gut wrench. I became, a, I, I believe I had the best gut wrench of anybody in the world. I could turn anybody with it. I even turned Gable in it one time in practice, and and uh, uh, he wasn't happy about that. But uh, he took it out on me. He got me back for it. He he turned me way more than I turned him. <laughs> yeah. We'll have to talk about that here in a second, Bonnie. I, I know I, you got to. I want to. I want to talk about that a little and, bit. And uh, I had to write myself down. No things to never do again. Do not throw Dan Gable on his head. <laughs> number two. Do not see number one. Do not throw Dan Gable on his head. <laughs> we're we're going to talk about that yeah. here in a second. Yeah. But so you still have your eye on the gold. Yeah. And you're battling these injuries, and you're battling getting. Um, you know, a lot of guys would just say, you know, this wrestling's tough. Anybody who's wrestled knows that it's tough. It, physically, it's a grinding sport, mm-hmm. and you got to get up. It's probably the toughest grinding sport there is. Yeah, you just got to keep grinding to be great. So you go for uh, two years, struggling a little bit. What happened to turn on to go wrestle off for the Olympics to make that Olympics team? Because you had to be some really good wrestlers to get into that position. Well, and 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 in 1984, I probably had I beat Leroy Smith three out of three matches. And then they they screwed me and they they protested it and they awarded him a victory in the match that I'd already won. And I was and I I was cutting weight to wrestle Ricky Delgado the next day. And all of a sudden they called me out and I had to re-wrestle Leroy Smith. And I went out and got hurt against him. And I had to go through federal binding arbitration. So I had to go through a lot of BS that should not have happened. And, wow. and uh, uh, but it did. And I finally, I mean, I had to go through a lot and I had to re-wrestle Leroy Smith for a minute and a half. And I, I had blown my knee out and I didn't even know if I could wrestle against him and, and I didn't know what was going to happen and, and I had to, and uh, Gable, and I said, Gable, I, I haven't been on the mat in three weeks. How am I going to be able to beat him? He said, he said, you've been wrestling for 15 years. You're not going to forget how and you, you just, and you, your shape's fine because you've been riding the aerodyne and I didn't even know if my knee was hurt and, but I know this, if I tried to test my knee before the match and it hurt that I would lose. But if and if it was hurt, I could I could win. I knew I I couldn't. In my mind, I had to know my knee was healthy, so I didn't even try it. I didn't even warm up at all before it, and I wrestled him. And then I beat Ricky Delegato the next day, who had beaten me 20 to 10 in a match earlier in the year in the Olympic trials. And then I beat him five to two, and then I beat him 16 to four, and wow. uh, that was after three weeks without being on the mat and just not knowing what I, what my knee could do but just believing in myself and after that i became i wrestled a lot of matches after that against russian dual meets and or something like that where i was hurt and but i still wrestled at, at times and uh uh i learned to just be ready to make the adjustments and i got a lot better at wrestling when i wasn't in as good as i wasn't in the type of shape physically and and i had a lot of uh, I I made the adjustments that actually made me way better. So you waited those three weeks to, to let your body rest. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I, I want to. We call our audience the achiever. Yeah. And I think that your story that you just shared is an amazing story about you got to be ready for the adjustments. Yeah. You've got to be yeah. ready for the adjustments. Yeah. You've got to have the right mindset to yeah. get there. And you've. I want you to tell us more about that mindset because you you knew that if you if you felt the knee ahead of time 
that that was going to impact yeah, you. So yeah. How did Never you give up? How did you say I, I your knew, mindset? I, well, I just said, I'm just going to assume that my knee's healthy and I, and I wrestled during the match and it didn't hurt at all. And I won and I said, okay, it's as good as new. And then the next day, uh, I beat Ricky Delegata twice. And if I could beat him 16 to four and I hit some of my best throws, even with a, a with a hurt knee where I couldn't lace leg and I had to do some other things, I knew I'm going to win. And that, and I, I, uh, I remember, uh, then I, I then, uh, I made the Olympic team and, and I went out with Mark and Dave Schultz and uh, I was so excited to be back on the Olympic team and we had a, a few a, a couple diet Pepsis in us and I told him that I'm going to tech fall everybody in the Olympics and nobody can stop my gut wrench and that's what I was thinking and I believed it and, and I remember telling Mark and Dave Schultz, you guys can't stop my gut wrench and they said, you can gut wrench us. And, um, so and I thought I could, and I did gut wrench Dave Schultz twice, but Mark was too strong for me. But that's what I—that was my mindset then that I could gut wrench everybody, and I—I I knew I—I I even gut wrenched Dan Gable twice in a row once. So you go on, you win the Olympics, <laughs> yeah, you get the gold. Yeah, You're with Evander Holyfield, a lot of yeah. famous people. Yeah, the Los Angeles uh, Olympics in 1984, you win that, and then you go on to wrestle the Russians like in a world tour, and. You end up uh, beating uh, Russia. And by that time, you I feel pretty good about few. yourself. Yeah, yeah, and, I was feeling uh, pretty good, and I beat a lot of Russian world champs. And and but uh, something you did, you, you're all your dad Larry was a big part yeah, of your success. Yeah, yeah. and uh, and Larry Lewis is obviously driven and like you are. Mm -hmm. And at 12 years old, you, there's a story out there that you're oh, gonna yeah. beat Dan Gable. Yeah. I remember, I'll tell you a story, this is, uh, people ask me, what's it like to wrestle Dan Gable? Well, you, yeah. The only people who really know what it's like to wrestle Dan Gable, you can't really tell anybody about this, you, you can't understand it unless you've wrestled him. And, and, but I do know this, that when I, was in, when I was 12 years old, I first thought, I first heard of Dan Gable, they said he, was, he just won the Olympics and nobody scored a point on him. And, I thought, well, if I was as big as him, I could beat him. And I weighed 70 pounds at the time. And so that was still my mind. That was my mindset then. I said, 19 years later, I finally moved up to 149 pounds, and I was as big as Dan Gable. And I found out I was wrong. <laughs> <laughs> and I had just wrestled a dual meet against Boris Budayev, who just won the world championships that year. And uh, he's the defending world champ from Russia. And I wrestled him and I made the adjustments because of my injuries with my knee and my uh, thing and, and boy I tell you what my throws were better and and faster because of my injuries and my adjustments and I was ahead of the rush and I threw him like three or four times and I was ahead 13 to 4 and pinned him and this is at 149 and a half pounds and set this is 19 years after Gable won his gold medal at the same weight, and Gable still only weighed the same. He weighs 158 before practice, you know. And so, we get into so a week later, I see Gable walk comes walking into practice. I said, Gable, you want to go today? Because I was feeling, you know, I just pinned the world champ. I'm pretty feeling pretty good about myself. And I was only feeling good about myself for about five seconds when we wrestled. <laughs> I, so, so Gable says, yeah, and he goes and warms up for like 45 minutes, and he's soaking in sweat. I'm just sitting in the front seat like this, sitting there, and let me know when you're ready, Gable. And uh, so we shake hands. I say, say one, two, three, go. And he goes, one, two, three, go. And he, his right leg was forward, and I hit kind of, I just immediately hopped across him, hit a Steven Seagal-type judo move, headlock, leg trip and threw Gable right to his back. Uh, that's one thing I'm never going to do again. <laughs> I, I wrote my wrote it down after that. Things not to do again. Throw Gable on his back. And then he bridged off and got on top of me and they cranked the shit out of me for quite a while. And I get up and all of a sudden I can't move my right arm. I felt like I'm in the Monty Python uh, movie where he gets, the, gets his arm cut off with a sword. Well, I don't have an arm. Well, it's, I'm left-handed, you know, so then Gable takes me down and cranks on the other shoulder, and I get up. Now I, I, don't, I can't use either of my arms. I mean, <laughs> wrestling with Gable was, was, uh, was not, 
not fun. And then Mark Johnson was our assistant coach, but he was wrestling some that day, so he didn't watch it. He goes, how'd you do with Gable? He goes, oh, God. I go, he beat me about 50 to 5. He goes, no way you're exaggerating. I said, okay. It was 50 to 4. <laughs> <laughs> And then Jay, Jay Rob, I, I didn't do much better against Jay Robinson either, yeah. our other coach. Uh, Jay Robinson and I would go 10 out of 10 one time. We did it three times, and uh, I'm 0 and 30 against him, so he got 10 out of 10 takedowns three times. And then, but after I won the Olympics uh, in about '86, where I wrestled, I ran into Jay somewhere at the national, at the NCAA tournament, and asked him if he wanted to go 10 takedowns again, and. I threw him twice. Jay forgot that you need to you need to wrestle Randy Lewis a specific way if you're going to beat me, and and he knew how to do that. But then he forgot about it for his first couple of takedowns, and I threw him to his back with some of my counter moves. And go, oh, looks like Captain Ramos is getting a little old. And, and I said, don't poke the bear. But I accidentally poked the bear there, <laughs> <laughs> and he uh, Jay got his game face on then and got the next eight takedowns. So he's 38 and two against me in takedowns there. <laughs> And the other, then I, I like that don't pick, poke the bear thing because Terry and Troy Steiner, are the, they're both national champs from North Dakota. And we always talked about wrestling for the Dakota title. And I used to beat on them pretty, pretty good. And, but they kept coming and coming and coming. And we're at the NCAAs one year, and it was when uh, Terry Steiner was uh, uh, redshirt. It was his redshirt, redshirt year or something. Where he, but... So he's uh, on the, on that Saturday morning. I was I'd, I'd been tired because I stayed out a few na- late a few nights at the NCAA tournament drinking some diet Pepsi's. And then <laughs> Terry was having his best day of practice against me that he's ever had. And and uh, Leroy Smith was the coach. And he says, "Okay, one more match. We're going to go one one match." And Terry Steiner says to me, "Lewis, you want to go this last match for the Dakota title?" And I said, "Okay." And then. Uh, I got my game face on then for the Dakota title, and I uh, beat Terry. I threw Terry Steiner on his back in about five seconds and beat him about 40 to zero. And they said, Terry, don't poke the bear. <laughs> <laughs> now, so what a career you've had. You've overcome obstacles, you stuck with it, you set goals. And, uh, you know, wrestlers, a lot of wrestlers today, yeah. Now back when you were there. Now we're going to, into the UFC. What, what's your thoughts on the UFC and how that affects wrestling? Well, uh, I like it. It's, and I know a lot of guys. Geez, Dan Severn, I know him. I, he was the first wrestler to win the UFC and, and get yeah. famous. And the, the UFC is dominated by wrestlers, you know. And uh, I went over to I, – I've known Dan Severn since we were, we were juniors in high school together. Well, I guess I'm a year younger than him, but we went out we, – um, and we've had a lot of wrestlers. I know Henry Cejudo well, and, and I think it's very good for it. And if they want to do it, you know, like wh- wh- who's a uh, Penn State guy that's doing it now? Um, uh, I'm not sure. Oh, geez, 185 pounds. He was a three-time national champ. I'm drawing a blank right now. Um, I am too. Um, um, the Italian guy. Was it the Italian guy? Or, uh, blonde guy. Um, I can't. Okay. Yeah, anyway, but you know, uh, so yeah, the UFC well, is. Uh, you, I like that. I'm so, yeah. I think it's brought some people to the wrestling, and then we got women's wrestling's growing. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's just going tenfold. Yeah. Um, and I think that's probably been good for the sport too, don't you? What's your thoughts? Um, I'm glad we got it. You know, and it's uh, um, they're doing real good, and, and I've I've seen. I'm seeing some really good technique from the from a lot of the women female wrestlers out there. And yeah. we're doing real good. Well, good. Yeah. You know, Monty, um, it, what a guy coming over to adversity, stuck with it, and achieved and broke through those ceilings. That's that's uh that's what I call mental toughness. You know, a lot of the yeah. things that, that you've shared with us, even before we started the, the show today, you talked about uh, being the toughest kid on the block, you outworked everyone, you were stronger, you were in better shape, and you started that as a young age. You you did it as a young age, you set goals, right. and you worked your tail off. Right, I knew that, I knew before every match, and you gotta, you gotta give yourself a reason to believe you can win. And my first year that was, I could do more pull-ups than everybody, and my dad told me, because 
they they maybe had been wrestling for two or three years and I was just my first year but I thought I was stronger because I could do more pull-ups and then the next year I actually got way better because I started going to camps and so by my sophomore year people that I I got beat when I was in eighth grade uh, eight to six by a guy then the next the next year I got ahead of I was ahead of me 11 zero and pinned him so I was making that broad jumps and then by my sophomore year in high school I I was 29 and 0 with 29 pins and and I was yeah. pinning I was I'd be ahead like 25 to 5 if I didn't pin yet going into the second What period. what do you think Third are the period. biggest couple reasons of your success? I mean what what made you have the success? Was it mindset was it your well, strength I, was it your skill? Well, it's cuz I did I did all the right things and believed it. I ran cross country so I knew I was better and I I ran hard. I did everything hard every time and my style of wrestling was not standing out here and and doing nothing and, and down blocking and, and and attack attack it, attack it's, it's like there was so much action in my thing so it was at a higher pace than everybody else was used to so if, if you if you and all my matches and all my practices were like you know in the first three minutes in the first like 10 minutes of a man of a practice someone's scoring 25 points they're going to put it up either he i'm going to they're going to get it on me or i'm going to get it on there there was a lot of points scored a lot of action in all my things and so people that are usually going out there and having a three to two match all of a sudden you get them in a 15 to 14 match and they're not used to it but i was and because i ran cross country and then i lifted weights really hard and and i wrestled really hard and i did all the right things and uh I believed in myself, and, and well, the, the motto in the wrestling room at the Iowa Hawkeyes was, "You don't wrestle to beat them; you wrestle to break them." I remember that you always. Well, I about. I didn't even need to break them because I I was like to pin them because, but I guess that's break. But I mean, yeah, yeah, that was more after me. Like the brands, they they break guys, okay, and they and I I broke guys too, but but uh, right. if I broke them, I'd pin them. Uh, um, yeah, you're a petty guy. And so I just, you know, I threw them. My, my, my goal was to pin everybody and score a bunch of points. And, like, I would – I wanted to put on a show. And I remember when I was in the Olympics and I, I won I won 24 to 11 in the Olympic finals. That's the highest scoring gold medal match in history. And in 1979, I had – I won 20 to 14, and that is the highest scoring NCAA finals mat, championship match in history. But – when I when I was uh, um, um, I forgot what I was saying here. It is you know Randy Lewis exactly. Randy Lewis is the guy. If you watched him wrestle, all action. And that's why a lot of people white, loved watching you wrestle. Oh, and I know. There, what there I was, was going to say my, there, my dad. No my dad came up to me before my gold medal match in 1984, and he says, "Randy, you don't need to." put on a show you just need to do what you need to do to win just wrestle smart and do this i said dad i'm gonna win but i definitely need to put on a show i said this is the biggest crowd i'm ever going to be in front of millions of people are going to watch this gold medal match on tv i'm putting on a show and showing them what wrestling's like and but i and i did i won 24 to 11 i hit a couple big throws on him and i went i think i was on my back only three times also <laughs> well, what, what, who was the guy you wrestled for the gold then? Kosei Akashi from Japan, and he got second, third, and fourth in the Olympics. He made three Olympic teams. He got, he placed in the top four in the World Olympics five times, and he medaled three times. He got a silver medal in the World and a silver medal in the Olympics. He in the, he moved up to 149 in the in the 1988 Olympics, and he lost to he lost to Nate Carr for the bronze medal match, and he lost to Fedzayev, who won the gold, and then in ninety. Uh, in '92, he he won the bronze medal at uh, uh, at 149. Yeah, so. Nate Carr got a silver that year, didn't he? Did What's he that? Did Nate Carr win it or got silver? Nate Carr. Nate Carr won. Nate Carr never won the worlds or the Olympics. He, he got bronze. Right. Okay. Nate Carr got bronze in the Olympics, and uh, okay. he was a great wrestler. And he beat the, he beat Kosei Akashi for the bronze, who was the same guy that I beat for the gold in '84. Gotcha. And then. And Nate Carr is the only guy I've ever I've, I've ever wrestled twice in my life that I haven't beat. If I if I've ever wrestled somebody twice and twice, the only guy that I've 
never beaten this Nate Carr. He's 2-0 and against me. <laughs> You've beaten everybody else. Wow, yeah. well, I'll tell you what, Monty. I think we have a great – he was a great guest today. I think, Randy, appreciate you coming out and joining us. And, uh, you know, I've learned a lot. I mean, you just don't give up. Absolutely. And you, you keep persevering and, uh, and having a two-year – there's a lot of people who would have just gave up. You know, you I know, I know this, and I know I, I never ever ever gave up an easy takedown in the match. I never ever let a guy go behind me because I was too tired to reach back or something. I know I gave my all every second of every match I ever wrestled, even if I'm ahead. 24 to 2 and there's no tech fall. I'm still trying to throw you on your back and pin you with 10 seconds left. Attack, attack. I, I think that's some great takeaways for our audience, the Achiever. You give your best in every match and prepare for adjustments. That, yeah. That's a big takeaway. Yeah. Give yourself a reason to believe you can win and work your tail off. You got to yep. have the skills. You got to outwork yep. the competition. You got to be stronger than the mm -hmm. competition and you got to be in better shape. So I, I, I think you shared some great insights for our mm -hmm. achievers. So I really appreciate your time and, and your expertise and your experience because that, that's been fun yeah. to. I, I wrestled in high school. I had to have my gym bag with me to get to 95 pounds because mm -hmm. I was yep. so small. Yep. But I counted more lights than anything else. So that wasn't, <laughs> uh, <laughs> that, that wasn't the, the end result. But thank you so much. We always like to ask uh, one last question. What do you want to be known for? When you think of the, the impact that you've made on the world, what do you want to be known well, for? Well, I think uh, I was back home in my hometown in Rapid City two weeks ago and I was looking through some thing, looking through some scrapbooks and there was articles in, when I was a junior in college at the, the NCAAs were in Oregon and Dan Gable and Stan Desick and several other people in, were quoted by the newspapers there as saying that Randy Lewis was the most exciting wrestler they ever saw. So I think that's what I'd like to do is I, I, I was a very exciting wrestler and I, I'm, I'm kind of known for that and I, and I think justifiably so. Yeah, I agree I'm with you there. One of the most exciting wrestlers you've ever seen and will ever see. Absolutely, yeah, a, absolutely. Well, thank you for joining us. Thank you to our audience, The Achiever, for joining us. Make sure you click like, make sure you subscribe. We really appreciate you joining us and uh, join us next time on the show.